to The Tenderness Revolution, a podcast about the stories of kindness, compassion and empathy that play out in our lives, because these deeply moving experiences describe what it means to be human and invite us into a new way of thinking about the world and each other. I'm your host, writer and journalist Yvonne Gavin, and every episode I'll be asking a new interviewee about a pivotal moment of tenderness that helped shape the course of their life. Today's conversation is with the author and expert listener, Katie Columbus, who very kindly gave me an insight into something that I've been fascinated by for a long time. What it's like to be a volunteer for the Samaritans. This brilliant UK charity who are really well known for the work they do helping people on the brink of committing suicide. Provide a safe space for anyone who's struggling with life to talk through whatever's on their mind, entirely free from judgment. I really wanted to ask Katie how she actually achieves this in her conversations as a Samaritan and also loved hearing what she had to say about how judging is closely linked to comparing and just how incredibly powerful adopting a non-judging mindset can be. Katie also talks about why being a good listener is so important and what it actually involves. It's actually the title of one of her books, How to Listen. During our conversation, she breaks the art of listening down into five really simple, really easy to remember steps that we can all use when we're with our partners, our friends, our children. They're so helpful. We also touch on depression and what it actually feels like and the cause of loneliness and so many other things and I really think that what we cover in this conversation is so important even though they might not be things the things we talk about that you often think about or consider I hope that by listening to this you maybe think about them a bit more and even become a little bit better at listening too if you'd like to know a bit more about the concept of tenderness that we're trying to promote on this podcast, we send out a newsletter before every episode that explains some of the ideas around the episodes. So if you'd like to be included, just message us on social media or pop us a quick email to the tenderness revolution at gmail and we'll add you right away. Thanks so much for your support as always. And I really do hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I'm so excited to be here today with author Katie Columbus. Welcome, Katie. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm really fascinated by what it means to be a really good listener. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you about ways to work on this really crucial life skill. Um, But before we do... I just want to start off by asking you to share your moment of tenderness with us, because the idea behind the Tenderness Revolution podcast is that essentially our lives are made up of all these little stories stitched together, where we felt a profound sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves, moments where we felt seen or understood, or that we had a deeper connection to the world around us. And it's then that we're sort of awakened to a greater sense of meaning and purpose. So Katie, please do share your moment with us. Yeah, thank you. So so my moment, and I think this was a a moment for me that really changed quite a lot in my life, was during the refugee crisis, um, where there were lots of people in Calais in the jungle. And um, I kind of, I was working at Sky in a big corporate job, and I, I had a very urgent need to help and to do something and I felt like it was a real struggle to work out what what could be done on the ground and and how we could get help to people who really needed it and I met a woman on social media I tried to set up a kind of local collection for people who were in the jungle I met a woman who was going in and out with caravans and carloads of stuff and finding people who needed things as they were coming in and out of their journeys And um, she just kind of had set up this 
this movement on the ground of, of really just going into the front line of, of everything kicking off in Calais and delivering stuff to people. So it was a kind of a one-to-one. -one. She was meeting people, working out what they needed, and she was doing it by herself. And so we banded together with her in the local community and this idea of kind of where do, who does this start with? Because if it doesn't start with you, then who does it start with? If not you, then who? Really stuck with me because I was like, she's just, she's going in and doing this by herself. Why don't we join her? And so we did a massive community collection for clothes and goods that were needed and books for children and bags of hygiene equipment and took them in. We did kind of a car rally and ended up having somebody locally who drove lorries taking stuff to Calais and as far actually as Lesbos. And one, one of the trips, I was eight months pregnant at the time that we were doing all of this. And so I couldn't go to the jungle all the time. So this lady went and did a drop off and met a woman who was also eight months pregnant. And she came back and told me about this woman who was sleeping on pallets with a rain soaked tarp over her. That was all she had. And I couldn't rectify the fact that I was in this comfortable bed at home in my house. I was eight months pregnant. She was eight months pregnant. And that was her journey. She was somehow just sleeping mm. with me and she was about to give birth. And so was I. And I couldn't I couldn't sleep for thinking about the fact that we were so similar and we were in the same space. I had all this stuff and she didn't and and it really stuck with me so the next weekend we took our caravan we had I've got two other children we had um this caravan that we would take to festivals and holidays and we drove the caravan into the jungle so that people could use that as a base particularly mothers or expectant mothers or people with little babies so we filled it full of all the stuff that we didn't need anymore from the little kids and toys and nappies and muslins and that kind of thing and and set up the car caravan as a base for people coming through and actually there was a story about it in the daily mail <laughs> of all places um that had actually that people coming into the jungle had set up five or six caravans because other people donated at the same time lots of caravan rallies for people driving their caravans for people to have housing and they'd set one up as um, an an art station, one up as a kitchen, one as a medical caravan. And then there was our one, which housed all the stuff for little kids and little babies. And there was a little child who came in that night and he was very traumatized and came in and found a pair of fancy dress butterfly wings that one of my little children had left in the caravan. And put a, it put a smile on their face. And it, it was such a small thing in and amidst that massive journey of chaos and trauma. But I thought, well, if it's done that one thing for that one person or if it's has one family for one night then then that's a good thing because if everybody just did one little thing one you know one gift of kindness or treating somebody with compassion if we all did that one thing there would be this collective wave of of good deeds that would keep a momentum going yes oh my goodness what a thing to what a thing to have been evolved in and and in a very kind of you know, concrete on the ground way. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that you, you know, you were saying about this, this human to human connection. I, I love the mm -hmm. fact that you came to that, you know, that you had that drive to do that because of this human to human connection. It mm -hmm. was the way that you connected to that woman. And then, you know, through your imagination, you, you know, you could really empathize with, what her life must be like and I, I just so agree I think it's really key I think these things like these having this kind of imagination for what it feels like to be someone else is mm. so important to try and cultivate it and and if we could all like you said just do that in a, even in a small way you know mm. I mean what you did was a huge in, you know incredible thing to put yourself out that way especially you know when you're just about to have a baby a third baby <laughs> but um that yeah that that kind of understanding and realization that we're all human exactly know? exactly that I think it was it was just so obvious you know that that kind of little epiphany moment it was so obvious mm. we were two human women who had born in, been born into very different circumstances 
and I was incredibly lucky and she was having a really hard time but we were we were the same and our children were the same and mm. our babies were going to be the same and mm. and that was kind of turning point and actually after shortly after that I jumped out of the um, corporate sector and that's what led to me moving into the charity sector and I got a job with Save the Children who obviously does amazing humanitarian aid work with children um, and that, but that was that was the moment at which I thought yeah there's something more that needs to be done and obviously there are the the, the jungle experience in Calais was was a very different experience I think from the way most humanitarian aid um, is run centrally because actually I think it's really important to go to charities who have the contacts and the resource and the knowledge about how to get aid to children and certainly my experience at Save the Children made me understand that and now with the situation in Ukraine for example or Afghanistan or Gaza those organizations are really key to having that really good knowledge and planning and systems to get stuff in and out so yeah that was what kind of led me down the charity route and that's why I ended up at Save the Children before Samaritans. For anyone listening in the UK I find it hard to believe that they wouldn't know about the Samaritans but for anyone listening that hasn't heard could you explain a bit about what the Samaritans do and also what the journey towards becoming a Samaritan a trained Samaritan Mm. looks like? Yeah so Samaritans are a suicide prevention charity we are UK wide and we are led by 20,000, over 20,000 volunteers all over the UK who are the most extraordinary people who really, I mean, I always kind of think of Samaritan's volunteers as some kind of heroes and I'll be like, wow, they're so amazing. They train and they do this really incredible job that I don't think many people could do. And most Samaritan's volunteers will say, I'm not a hero, I'm just a normal person. I'm just a normal person being there for another normal person. And actually the way I describe them is just, ordinary people doing something extraordinary and the reason for that is the act of listening is so simple the whole Samaritans ethos is based on the principle of active listening so the idea really is that people can contact us on the phone um, by email by letter even and actually we're we're currently piloting online chat for people to get in touch with us digitally Mm -hmm. and the idea is that it's anonymous so you don't know who you're talking to you might never you chances are you will never meet the person that you're talking to so you can come along in an anonymous space and say whatever you like to that person in that moment if you're really really struggling if you really feel like you don't know how to continue if you feel like life is so hard that you are kind of barely clinging on you can come and speak to a real person and say this is what I'm going through and that person will not judge you they won't respond in a way that could be negative for you they will hold you in this safe space of just listening to you and encouraging you to talk and the idea is to allow people to talk and talk and talk as much as possible because actually people know what is best for themselves they know themselves better than anyone else And rather than someone saying, right, well, here's what I think you should do. You've told me about your problem. Now I'm going to fix it for you. That can be really detrimental to somebody, particularly somebody who's in distress. who might be having very low self-esteem thoughts or, you know, rumination where they've got a thought running round and round and round in their head and they're thinking I'm worthless. Mm -hmm. If they run to you and you say to them, yeah, actually, I'm going to fix this for you because you obviously can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. That can be for that person in the moment that they're not good enough to fix it themselves. So actually what Samaritans volunteers try and do is give the power back to that person to say, actually, you do know your own way through this. Not as obviously as that, but by saying, what do you think you could do next? What have you thought about that you might be able to try? So keep passing the power back to that person until they've thought about everything that they might want to do, the next step that they might want to take, and until they get to a place where they think, perhaps I could try this, perhaps I could do that, perhaps I could get through the next five minutes or the next hour or the next day. And they have the control to think this is how I would like to do it. And actually, if you, even if you go to a therapist or if you speak to a friend or family member, that often people will just try and jump in and fix and control and make things better for Mm. that person. 
Mm. probably from a place of wanting to help and do good mm. and if if you know that person and you love them you you're desperate to help them out of a really bad situation um but that can be detrimental like for that person who's thinking oh actually you're not really even listening to what I'm saying because what I'm telling you is I don't want you to fix this I just want you to be there with me in this moment so it's it's those that principle of active listening is the mm. key Mm. to everything that we do for people in distress mm. yeah I'm really really interested in sort of going deeper into that tendency that seems so you know sort of just comes up in so many people most people that, that I know and I love the way the way you talk about it coming from a place of deep caring and but it, I'd love to talk a bit about that with you in a minute, because I think it's really, really crucial to listening and understanding how to be a better listener. Um, could you, I'm just really interested in how you become a Samaritan and what that mm. looks like. I mean, I, I presume there's quite a lot of training involved. Yeah, yeah. So there are there is a lot of training. And um, once you've gone through your kind of intensive training in active listening and the values and the principles of Samaritans and what we do and how we're there for people and how active listening works you then um, work with a mentor before you take begin to take calls and once you do start taking calls there's a very robust support system around you um, because as you can imagine for Samaritans volunteers it's they can often go through um, very strong emotions themselves if they've had a particularly difficult call or you know what happens when somebody puts the phone down and you have to be okay with that as a man you've got to be able to let that go mm. a very strong sense of support for listening volunteers who are there for each other so if there's a very difficult call or it's been a difficult shift you have a partner you're always with somebody else so that you can talk through what you've experienced and at the end of a shift you have a shift leader who you can kind of debrief and and talk everything out of your system that you might have experienced in that moment so that yeah there's a very very robust training system and a strong support system as well yeah I mean gosh what you just said about how difficult it must feel you know particularly when you're starting off and then you know in, with regards to particular conversations or maybe something that really resonated with you or made you think of something that's happened in your life I can really mm. imagine how challenging it must be I mean amazing opportunity for growth but so I'd like to talk a bit later on with you about sort of self-care and how that comes in to being a Samaritan but just for now could you just sum up I know it's a big question I know it's really this topic of your brilliant book how to listen but could you like sum up if you could just why listening to others is so important can I summarize it I'll try and do it in a nutshell <laughs> days I think the reason that it is so important is because it listening validates someone's experience and validation is really, really key to the human experience. And I think actually in terms of the way we grow up, there's this idea that when children are little, they're taught, oh, you know, don't cry, shush. Or if they get angry, they're told by parents or teachers, you know, pack it in, shush, we don't want to see this behavior. And actually, you know, that comes again from a well-meaning place where people are saying, um, I don't like to see you upset. I don't like to see you cross. So let's fix mm. this and let's... Mm. But what that teaches us over time is that we shouldn't be feeling those feelings and we shouldn't be expressing them. And that compounded by other life lessons around what you should and shouldn't say out loud leads to this idea that actually we should repress negative feelings, which can be really dangerous because it's like an injury that compounds on an injury. You wouldn't run, keep running on a... Um, on an ankle with an injury because you would make it worse and it's the same with our feelings actually if we repress them we compound injury on emotional injury until it all explodes like a volcano or until we end up just so inside ourselves with our feelings that 
that we have significant distress. And I think the power of listening is just saying to someone, say whatever it is that you need to say and I will not judge you. And that is the pressure release valve for people who call Samaritans or contact us. The idea that you can say something that you might never have said to anyone else, that you might think is the worst thing that you could possibly say out loud. People say it and nothing happens. The sky doesn't fall in. You don't get judged. No one is telling you off. And in fact, you've got somebody there saying to you, I'm so sorry, that sounds really, really difficult. Tell me a bit more about that. And that kind of the weight that is lifted off people's shoulders in that moment from just saying, okay, I validate you in this moment, because whatever they're feeling, might you might not understand it. And you might think, oh, I don't know why you're reacting like that. I wouldn't. I don't know why you're thinking that because I wouldn't. It doesn't really matter because what that person is feeling in that moment is true and real to them. I mean, that is so yeah. key, isn't it? That's yeah. something that I really picked up. Uh, from in your book this idea I think you said you never know exactly how someone else is feeling and what they're going through Mm -hmm. how can you we all react differently and have different life experiences why do you think it's so difficult for most of us to fully accept or appreciate this because the truth is like every single human has a different life experience they have a different lens and it's not really what happens to you, it's how you feel about it. So I guess the feeling part is really key there. Yeah. And I wonder if it's because we find it hard to imagine difference. Like so many of us can only imagine our own experience and only come at life from what we know. I don't know, what what do you think? I think you're right, actually, and I think that's a really natural reaction, isn't it? That we've only got our own lens through which we see things. We've filtered everything through our own experience. So, so yeah, it's hard to think about what somebody else might be going through. But actually, actually, I'm not sure that that's the point of listening because it's not up. So say I have a problem and I come to you. It's not up to you to understand what I'm going through because it doesn't. you don't need to understand what I'm going through. All you need to do is say that sounds really tough, I'm so sorry, could you tell me a bit more? Mm. Because the idea isn't for you to completely understand every bit of my pain, but it's for you to allow me to talk and process. Because actually when we say things out loud, we hear it back in a different way. The way our brain works is that by by talking, you you move things from the emotional part of your brain to the rational thinking part of your brain, which allows you to externalize and start to take those steps forward into making better decisions. When you're in the kind of chaotic emotional part and everything feels difficult and stressful, the way that we process is to talk, which then allows us to, you know, allows the logical rational part of the brain to open up. So we begin to think, well, actually, perhaps I could, you know, get up and get a shower or Mm -hmm. maybe going out of my house Mm. so the whole point of you listening to me is is to say could you just tell me a bit more about that because you mentioned this and would you mind just elaborating and and actually I think that's the second the second part and I always remember them because they rhyme as validation and elaboration one of the people that I interviewed for the book so I remember them saying the best place that you can get to when you're listening to somebody is when they get bored because when they're bored of talking, they've, they've gone through every possible bit that they want to work through. So they've mm-hmm. talked as much as they can. And when they get a bit bored of talking, you've done a really good job because actually you've let them get everything out of their system. You validated their feeling in the moment and then you've allowed them to elaborate and you've kept asking open questions that don't shut down the conversation. Um, and that allows them to just keep elaborating and keep talking, keep talking until they get bored. And then you know that you've done a good job. Well, that's that's so interesting. I love to sort of get an insight into that when you have all these difficult feelings and that and you talk about them, it's actually you're processing them and you're working mm. through them. I had never thought about it like that. That's that's really interesting. And just how amazing to be able to give someone else that space. Mm. Um, but it it seems like a really big 
barrier to really listening to others I think is fear this thing of fear yeah. so there's this worry that if a topic is sensitive or if the conversation will be difficult for you or for them there's a sense of well, I just want to avoid it uh, and you mentioned in your book about this fear of saying the wrong thing mm. how, now how can we work on that I, it's such a it's such a good point because I think there's just a fundamental misunderstanding about what it means to be a good listener because if if you give someone the wrong you can give someone the wrong advice if you give someone advice and it doesn't work for them it's the wrong advice but if you just listen to somebody you can't go wrong if you know I, I use this example of if we went through something similar say um, a bereavement and I come to you and say oh, I've, I've been through this situation and you say oh I went through something exactly the same let me tell you all about it here's what I did I started jogging and that really improved my headspace and so now I go for a jog and that really helps me so why don't you go for a jog so I'm in my confused um overwhelmed state and I go out for a jog and I hate running and my feet really hurt and I come home and my feet hurt and I'm really cross with you because you've told me to go for a run and I've still got my problem actually that sense of fixing and projecting that here's what I did so you should do it too can be the wrong thing it can be the wrong advice to give to somebody whereas if you said has this ever happened has this feeling ever happened to you before is there anything that you did last time that worked for you what do you think could help you it allows me to think well actually what I'd really like to do is a yoga class and that really helps me connect and that really helps me breathe and slow things down so that's the thing that helps me and thank you for having that discussion with me to allow me to and what would work best for me I think that there is this idea that people are so afraid of of getting it wrong and if if you said to somebody you seem really depressed and that person said yeah I'm really depressed and here's everything that's going on for me there's an idea that you then have to take that on your shoulders and that would then be your burden and your responsibility mm. not because we all go through ups and downs we all have really hard times no one is saying add this to the weight of the world that sits on your shoulders all they're saying is they want to have a conversation about it and and talk but not in a way that is detrimental to anyone else you don't have to fix someone else's problems you don't have to take on their burden all you have to do is be there for that person in that moment stand alongside them and listen to what they have to say and that's it then you can leave you don't need to worry about that person because chances are if you've had a good conversation that's been a catalyst for that person to think you know what that was a really good conversation but I still feel like I might need help then they might go to the doctors then they might go and see a talking therapist they will then take the next step by themselves you're not responsible for them and no one there's there's no way that people can take that on and I don't think the person with the problem would be asking for that sometimes people do ask for help but if someone's asking for you just to listen to them they're not saying here you go now you have my problem yeah I think that's that's the key isn't it I think we do feel like we have to solve this and we have to fix this but yeah. what people really want is just to be listened and I think it's brilliant the way you pointed out that you know people will find their own solution if you gently guide them and, and gently question them about you know what made you feel better the last time you had these difficult feelings mm. um that thing of ah, oh, we know the answer like we actually know what we need but it's it's kind of so deep inside mm. that knowing that it's like buried underneath all these difficult feelings and getting to it is 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 tricky and it sounds like a big part of what you do is help people get to that kind of remembering and knowing exactly and you only get to that place by continuing to talk through all these different options and that's where the elaboration comes in to think you know if you one of the things when you train as a Samaritan um, is about clarifying what you've heard because actually in a conversation if somebody's in full flow they might not have realize that they've said something very key so you might clarify what you've heard by saying to that person can I just check that when you said it felt like you were 
in a really dark place what does that mean and what does that look like and how does that feel and that person might think oh blimey I didn't realize I said that I didn't realize I said I was in a dark place and actually what do I mean actually I mean it looks really scary and I feel like something is really out of control and then you can say can you talk a little bit more about that feeling of being out of control what does that feel like or what does that mean to you and um, that person can then really get into those feelings of feeling in control and why they feel out of control and what that means to them so it's clarifying what you've heard that might have felt like a throwaway comment that might have kind of glossed over something that can lead people into getting much more into the kind of roots of what it is that they're feeling is that because choice like feeling that you have choice and agency is like really key to good mental health I think a lot of where we are in terms of the balance if you think about the emotional health scale I think so as mentioned we use emotional health scale which is like a triangle like a doorstop shaped wedge and if you're at the top of the doorstop wedge of the triangle that's when you're feeling balanced and you're in control and everything is going well and then if something happens that's outside of your control, like you lose your job, um, you move a bit further down the scale. So it's like a sliding scale like this. And things can happen where you might lose your job. So you move a bit further down. That puts pressure on your relationship. So you move a bit further down. That puts pressure on the fact that um, if, you're, if you're losing your job and your relationship, maybe you lose custody of your children and then you can't pay your bills in your temporary housing. And so then suddenly you've got no home, no relationship, no family, no money. And you're right at the bottom end of the doorstop wedge, which is the emotional health scale. And then suddenly your toaster explodes mm. and you can't cope anymore. Mm. People phone us and say, my toaster's exploded. I can't cope. Then you work back to work mm. out what external influences that have led you to get to end up in this point and those all of those external things can be any kind of big life change it can be going to university it can be um bereavement it can be getting divorced it can be redundancy all of these big things can have an effect on you that you cannot control and that obviously there are also then internal things as to how resilient you might be feeling um, and those things combined can really lead to us slipping and sliding up and down this emotional health scale. And it's a real combination of internal and external factors. And some of those we are in control of and some of them we're not. And so it's really important to be clear on what are the things that I'm in control of and what can I do and how can I work on a plan for myself to be resilient? Because when those big external factors come along as they do with everyone throughout our lives yeah how it's prepared to be resilient in the face of those big external factors that we're out of control of and like I say it could be moving house or it could be going to university something that makes you feel lonely for the first time and makes you feel that disconnect yeah it's it's really important to have a sense of resilience around what you feel like you can control and what you know you can't and to have oh. the different your own mind between the two mm. gosh it's so interesting to think about you know human mental health in that way and just really important to sort of have that reminder that we're all there like we're all on that spectrum like we're all kind of moving up and down depending on what experiences we're having and there's no such thing as a person who's untouched by difficulties or you know doesn't have these highs and lows or doesn't have really difficult patches uh it's it's just really important to keep talking about that and to remember that because I think often we compare ourselves to others and think well they don't get, nobody else goes through this or nobody else struggles with this mm. but uh I'm not sure if that's if that's ever really true um I think as well that goes back to the the validation it might be that um, you have a much higher resilience at moving house. Yeah. And that, that really stresses me out, moving for streets up the road. The external factors there are totally irrelevant because the reality is I feel very stressed by moving yeah. for the road. You don't feel stressed by moving to a different country. 
the reality is that we both have different feelings because we're different people but what's true in the moment is our emotional reaction and it's really important to remember that our feelings our emotions are a reaction they're not a choice I'm not choosing whether or not I'm stressed about this it, I'm just reacting to what's going on around me because of all of the different circumstances that have made me who I am and everything else that's going on in my life at that time so everything that somebody is feeling in the moment is valid to them based on everything that's got them to where they are as well as everything that's currently going on for them yeah and oh and it comes back to this thing again of just listening when someone says they're finding something hard rather Mm -hmm. than comparing it to your experience or telling them something like well you've been through it before so you'll be Mm -hmm. fine um I you know because I'm I'm we just were talking before about this move that I'm doing and I actually find the moves really destabilizing and really hard and they really Mm -hmm. affect sort of um my sense of self and my relationships and I, I have found, you know, sometimes mentioning this to people, they they do say, well, oh, but you've done it before. <clears throat> and it's like, yeah, that's why I've got like this, this kind of fear that it's going to be just as hard as it was last time. That kind of blocks, you know, that, um, that capacity to just let go, because I have this, oh, no, 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 it's going to be just like it was before. So doing something, even though sometimes it can help having experience, sometimes it can also make it tricky because you're sort of looking Mm. back with fear um but I I wanted to to talk a little bit about um an image that that you describe in the book that really was so powerful for me so in the book you say that um as humans what we really want is just for others to be there for us like I was just describing Mm. and you described someone in emotional distress as, I think it was during your training, there was this um, description of someone like falling into a pit or like, yeah. and how like the tendency for loved ones is this, is this sense of wanting to pull them out. And I mm-hmm. really had this clear image of these hands like reaching down into this kind of dark pit um but what you're taught to do as Samaritans is actually climb in and sit Mm -hmm. alongside them I just I found that so powerful I almost like started crying just by imagining it and it reminded me sorry go on I was gonna say it's, it's such a powerful image and I think that's that is the one that always sticks with me because at Samaritans we say we don't save people we stand alongside them until they're ready to save themselves Mm. and such an important thing to remember that you know we're not doing anything for people they're doing it by themselves they've got the power to do it they just need to remember that they are capable and I think that image of the pit is really is one that's always stuck with me with this idea that actually if someone is sitting in a big dark hole as if you have a tendency if you know that person if you love them you might want to run off and get your ladder and put the ladder in the pit and drag them out and say, come on, it's really nice up here and the sky's bright and the birds are singing. The person down there knows that it's all blue skies and sunshine where you are. And if they had any way of getting out of the pit themselves, they would have done it. Mm. So what a Samaritan will do is go and get the ladder, put it in the hole, but then climb down and sit at the bottom of the pit alongside that person and just be there with them in the moment and talk to them and ask them what it feels like what does the dark look like what does the dark feel like for you could you tell me a bit more about that and when that person is ready they'll be there with them for them to put their first foot on the first rung of the ladder Mm -hmm. and it's it's such an important difference between trying to yoink someone up and pull someone out before they're ready actually being alongside somebody in that moment is the most crucial thing to having their trust and creating that sense of safety and that sense of human connection and compassion that will allow them to take that step and you still be alongside them. Somebody else I interviewed for the book described it as um, when you are speaking to somebody in distress, it's like holding their backpack whilst they're climbing up a mountain. So the part of the journey where it's really difficult when they're scaling their mountain, 
you hold the backpack for them you just bear the weight of that for them and eventually you do have to give it back but you've helped them through the difficult bit of the journey by bearing the weight for them and then they feel like they can keep going and that's another really nice image of of how to remember that difference I think but sorry you were going to tell me what it reminded no. you of. oh my gosh there's so many things that you've just said that I I want to sort of pick up on because it's it's so interesting um but I was I was just going to describe to you that image that you described reminded me of um there's a, a tv show called made I don't know if you saw it it was brilliant oh yes it's brilliant yeah so brilliant. brilliant and it really reminded me of this bit which I think it was such a brilliant creative visual depiction of when someone's mental health deteriorates when she yes. so it, it's about a young woman who you know is a single mom and she has a really difficult sort of abusive relationship with her partner and they live in a trailer and she keeps leaving him and there's this one bit where he she goes back to him and it, her mental health just deteriorates to the point where they show her like it's like her she sinks down into the ground yeah. and she's in this pit and she's looking up and it's just how you describe she can see that that it's light up there she yeah. can see that people are talking and you know and that's like the world that people with good mental health inhabit but she's mm -hmm. down and she can't actually get up and it's that sense of like she she can't she can't do it she's she's stuck and mm. that that sense of stuckness it, it was it was so clear you know in that they, they depicted it in such a, a brilliant way and such a brilliant way when she goes down the back of the sofa and yes you can yes and she falls just, she just falls yeah. just kind of ducked down into this kind of dark kind of yeah like a pit yeah. and she can see she can see what it's like to not be mm. down there but yet she still can't get there on her own and mm probably couldn't get up if someone tried to pull her either exactly it's um, too far to reach. exactly I think it's it was such a brilliant depiction of that sense of numbness and disassociation and actually what what I found so brilliant about that was that I've heard lots of people say to me I people often don't know what they're experiencing as they're experiencing it you know when you can't see the wood for the trees and you know that something's wrong but you don't exactly know what is going on so people have described being depressed as seeing the sun but not being able to feel the warmth of it or you know feeling mm. numb rather than really really sad so there's no more tears numb so they didn't realize that that was depression or anxiety because it doesn't kind of fit the the mold of what people might think different kind of emotional well-being means and actually what that that bit about her falling down the back of the sofa just did such a good job of she just didn't know what was going on for her. All she knew was that she was completely numb and disassociated from the world and she had no idea how to get out of that herself she couldn't do it and she did obviously and that's the amazing thing about that show yeah um, it was such a good that that sense of numbness and disassociation was was that you know you could really see that actually lots of people go through that because if you don't know enough about emotional well-being or mental health, you might not understand the difference between low mood and depression or mm. anxiety now or all of the different nuances of what people might be feeling. It's really important that people, I think it's really important that people have that understanding and, and the only way we'll get to that is by talking about it, as you're saying. Yeah, definitely. And that makes me think about loneliness I know this is something that you've talked about mm. um, I mean during the pandemic lots of people were struggling with loneliness when they were actually prevented from having mm. contact with other people but I love the description in your book of loneliness as a feeling of disconnection one that people can struggle with even when they're in a relationship or when they're like looking at social media and I wanted to ask you, like, why do you think levels of loneliness, particularly in developed countries, are at an all-time high? 
and what can we do about it I mean I would imagine listening is a really good place to start <laughs> I mean so, I mean yes exactly why I wrote how to listen in the first place because it was at the beginning of the first lockdown when everybody was saying well you know we've really got to talk to each other about how we're feeling because the conversation went very quickly in lockdown from how are you feeling physically have you got any physical symptoms of this illness it went very quickly to then and how are you feeling because it was such an extraordinary set of circumstances where we were all then completely isolated from each other or either stuck in a house with a bunch of people um, or stuck at home with no one. And I felt like we were sat on this goldmine of information at Samaritans around how to listen to one another, because when we were being told to talk, actually, we also needed to learn how to listen so that we could support each other properly. And so that really was a sense of how can we alleviate that sense of isolation by talking to friends and family, talking to our neighbours, talking to our colleagues on Zoom and how we do this digitally. And so, so yeah, the easy answer is to say we all listen to each other a lot better. But I think it is important to realise that that loneliness is is a disconnect, disconnect. It's not about living in the Outer Hebrides and not seeing people, although that is that is real isolation. Um, The sense of being disconnected in a relationship or feeling lonely in a crowd are really real feelings. And I think it goes back to understanding your sense of self day to day, because some people are introvert and they love having time alone. That's the thing that recharges them. So isolation isn't a bad thing for everyone. It's important to understand what, what's my go-to, you know, if I am isolating myself, is that because I'm experiencing stress, depression, anxiety, and I don't want people to see it or I can't face up to it. Or do I need to take out half a day to recharge my batteries and not speak to anybody? Because that's what makes me feel good. That's that's how I work. Mm. And I think it's important that people interrogate and are curious about what they need. Some people really need to be in a big group of people and some people really need to take time out and everyone is different. But if we have a sense of what works for us, we have a sense of the things that will re- recharge our batteries and make us feel better. Um, and in terms of why why we feel so lonely now, I, I do really feel like the digital world is playing a big part in that because there's such a sense of overwhelm, continual overwhelm, that at any given moment, you've got five or six different streams of information you don't know if half of it is true you don't know who the people are that are saying it some of them are really nasty online some of them look like they're having the best time ever they might not be but they've got these amazing filters that makes it look like they are so there's a complete overwhelming sense like a barrage of information that's flooding our systems and our brains are working really hard to adapt to that Because if every four seconds we're getting a new headline of something really distressing, how can our brains not continually be in the fight flight mode? We're constantly privy to quite distressing things. And that's just the headlines. If you click on comments, then you fall into the pit of the Internet and you've got even more overwhelming content, which can make you feel disconnected and stressed out. That's so true. And I sometimes wonder if 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 we realize just the impact that that it has on us to be exposed to all these different forms of information. I mean, it's really important to to be aware of what's going on in the world. And, you know, if you can be, you know, taking part in in trying to do something, you know, something useful and show that you care but also you you have to have boundaries around all of that Mm. and um even like my parents they tend to have the television on like the news on a lot and you know especially um around the beginning of the the war in ukraine they were constantly watching it and my mum was was getting so upset and anxious and Mm. you know i've it's really good that she's aware of it. Like I want her to, you know, I was suggesting to her, you know, why not try volunteering for, for something connected to, you know, the Ukraine war, there must be um, 
an organization that's looking for donations or people to help, you know, organize donations or because she does do volunteering. So it's that thing sometimes of stopping the, you know, the barrage of information or turning away from it or pausing it Mm. and actually having that agency to say, well, what can I do? Like, how can I help? Mm. What can I do about this? Um, And first of all, I guess you have to notice, you have to be aware of the way it makes you feel. Mm. And I think it then goes back to control because actually that overwhelming barrage of information can make you feel completely out of control. And if you're occupying that emotional part of your brain where the fight flight response is like a little alarm system ringing in your brain, that's like, I can't cope with this. This is making me feel really emotional. It's almost addictive, isn't it? That we then continue to stay in that state by absorbing more and more and more negative information. But I think what, what's important and what's really nice about what you've just said is, is recognising what do I have control over here? What can I do and what can't I do? So mm-hmm. I can read the news and I can make sure that I'm up to date, but I can also switch off the TV, mm-hmm. turn mm-hmm. off my phone so that I'm not completely addicted to just doom scrolling. Mm-hmm. And I can go and donate big bags of clothes to my local Red Cross and I know that that money will go directly to Ukraine. So it's about thinking as logically as you can around what can I control and what can't I control? And the, the sense of boundaries is really important too mm. because it's, it's hard, but it's really important to recognise what can I do if I am so overwhelmed by this that I have gone under and I, I'm unable to function, like it's so overwhelming that I can't get out of bed. If I've got into that, that place, what I need to do is then, you know, acknowledge that that's a thing and today I'm feeling rubbish and I'm going to stay in bed and tomorrow I'll try again that's completely valid and that's okay but then it's about thinking about right what's the plan what's my list to say tomorrow here's what I'm going to do and whether that's just getting up and having a shower and going out for a walk or whether that's thinking about what you can do to help the situation in Ukraine by volunteering or doing good in another way it's really important to give yourself permission to react the way you're reacting and then make little steps mm, rather than yeah. trying to yeah. face it all. So, so useful. So it's, it's like the two parts. It's having compassion, having self-compassion mm. for the way you feel, no judgment. And then like, what logical steps can I take? Like, how can mm. I actually do something to feel better. Mm -hmm. I just think remembering those two things, it's really, really helpful and useful. Um, And also externalizing all of the things that you are overwhelmed by. There was somebody in the second book, Pathways, who described this worry dump. Actually, there's two things that were really good and that I always remember from the second book. The worry dump is just writing down everything that's going on in your brain. So just take Mm. a piece of paper absolutely everything until you've covered every inch of the page and by externalizing those feelings obviously looking through them really helps but sometimes it's hard to do that Mm. so you can them down as much as you can and once everything is down and out on the paper it's like the paper is holding all of those problems Mm. and you have a sense of relief that you've got it out of your head and then you can make your list that says right I'm going to get up I'm going to go and have some breakfast I'm going to have a shower I'm going to try and go outside or I'm going to you know whatever Mm. your plan day you can you've got to that place of feeling slightly more rational and logical to allow you to take those next steps the other one I absolutely loved was um from somebody who did lots of music therapy and she um she said what you can also do is have a recreational weep playlist I've never heard this before but it's brilliant so she was like find every song that makes you cry and when you feel really sad listen to the songs that make you cry cry it all out because that's how you cry all of the stress hormones out of your tear ducts or that cortisol comes out of your system because you're crying it all out once it's out you're like okay I'm gonna leave that behind I've done my massive cry with my recreational weep playlist and now I can have the strength to get up and move on into the doing bit now that I felt my feelings I've accepted them I can now get on and do stuff ah oh, they're so brilliant they're such brilliant <laughs> tips I love them it makes me think of my my oldest daughter doing her GCSEs at the moment and um, she she got really overwhelmed and she told me, she said, oh, you know, I think I just needed a really good cry. And mm. she I think she did that. She watched like a, a film 
that she knew that she, you know she loved this film and it made her cry whenever she watched it mm. and she just cried and cried and she said I felt so much better it's just what Perfect. I needed <laughs> yeah. We, yeah I mean so there is that phrase you know sometimes I just need a really good cry but I think it's mm. it's undervalued and there can be shame in in crying you know that oh yeah. I cried and I let myself cry but maybe it, let's it undo is. that cry it all out get those get the stress hormones out your tear ducts it's science <laughs> brilliant I love those tips um I just want to talk a little bit about judgment um I just wrote an essay on judgment and why it's such a habitual mindset that so many of us fall into and why we do it and it was really interesting in the book you said it's like a block to listening mm. um but I I mean it, it's such a crucial and it's such a big subject but I just wondered like what did your Samaritan training teach you like how did it teach you to cultivate a non-judging mind because it's so key I think partly in terms of how you're trained to do it it's almost like exercising the muscle of how how to listen actively and I always think of it as essentially my opinion of somebody doesn't matter my thoughts about what they're saying doesn't matter and it's much harder to do actually if you're listening to somebody that you know or love because actually you got um pre-existing information about that person and so you might you know we've all had those um kind of conversations or arguments where you think oh I know exactly what's going to happen now because mm. you're already thinking you're already judging and you're already thinking I know what you're going to say I know how you're going to act I know what you're going to do so you sort of can't help it because it's inbuilt when you're reacting to somebody that you know really well or you might do it accidentally just by re- your face reacting in a certain way to what someone is saying um so there's a real differentiation between trying not to seem judgmental to somebody you, that you know which is actually a lot harder because like I say you've got all that existing information about how you think they're going to react when you're in a place where it's an anonymous person it just my opinion just doesn't matter about whatever it is they can say they can say whatever they like my role isn't to think to myself oh what do I think about that it, it just doesn't matter my role is to say and tell me a little bit more about that or I'm sorry this sounds really really difficult and it's like a game of ping pong where you are just knocking the ball gently back into that person's court mm. to say, right back with you because I'm trying to keep myself out of the conversation as much as possible I don't matter that person matters and what they need to say matters so all I'm doing is enabling them to say tell me a little bit more is there anything else that you want to talk through what else is going on so my feelings are completely irrelevant it's all about their feelings and your focus is entirely on the other person and that's and that sense of human connection comes alive in that moment when they know that you are listening to them completely and you have that connection with them and it creates that bond of trust. And that's when they feel like they can keep elaborating. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so fascinating when you describe that actual process and how it works, you know, between you as a Samaritan, as a listener, and the person who's calling um yeah amazing but it makes me think also that we could all learn to do that I think by becoming aware of that judging part of us that kicks in Mm -hmm. like to to sort of notice when it happens because so often Mm -hmm. we're just unaware and there's no like pause between making a judgment and then coming out with it or responding or acting on it and I think it's that that pause isn't it that space of Mm. oh oh there's a judgment there can I just put it to one side can I can I just leave it there and just focus on this person it's a and it's a muscle and I I I believe that it's possible for all of us to do this it's not Mm. just because we maybe don't it doesn't mean we can't learn yeah, exactly. And I think that that idea of a pause is is really important. And that's the thing to practice. And when you practice it and you realise how well it works, that's the thing that will keep you 
trying to listen better. So if if you hear something and you pause and think, is this about me? No, it's not. So I'm going to remove my judgment. This isn't about how I'm feeling. Or if you pause and think, what's my initial reaction here? My initial reaction probably is to fix this and make it better. I don't need to do that. Like take a moment and think, don't fix this. Actually, what do you need to do? And and then over time, your brain will just go back to that person to say, I'm so sorry, let's talk about this. Or do you, would you like to talk about it? Or, you know, wh- whatever, however you pass the power back. It's the pause and practicing non-judgment and not needing to fix. And those two things in themselves, if we all just go away and practice that, doesn't come naturally because like I say humans innately want to help each other but it's understanding that that help isn't always helpful Mm. so yeah the pause is a really good one to practice Mm. and silence too I love the way you talk about um the wisest thing you can do on a call sometimes is just shut up Mm. and this allows that silence to be filled with the other person so they can fill in the blanks and find their own way forwards. Mm. I, I don't know if, if, you, if you wanted to do this, but I wondered if you wanted to share like a, a particular experience on a call where you did that and it was really powerful and it had a really good... I, I, I wouldn't share any information on that because it's a completely confidential service and I and I always think I would never want any to put anyone off from calling if they thought anybody was then going to go and talk about the content of their course of course I think in general the the silence is where people are often processing their own thoughts Mm. if you've asked an open question like could you tell me a little bit more about that to like test the silence for as long as you can because actually if you jump in and keep blabbering on that per- it disrupts that person's thought process whereas actually in the silence they might be thinking actually what are we talking about what do I feel and it can go on for a really long time and I'd say have courage to go against the feeling of wanting to feel the silence because it feels awkward yeah. like it's a British thing isn't it yeah. to jump feel the silence because we just feel a bit awkward yeah that is when that person is formulating their thoughts and their thought process to get to the place where they will eventually speak. Mm. I think it's really so good to reframe it as not an awkward silence, but like yeah. a really important silence. Necessary. <laughs> yeah. Necessary. And um, in all this work that you do and, and all the, the amazing work that all the Samaritans do, at the beginning, we touched on this thing of, of self care. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I wonder if, if you could share any sort of practice that really helps you and enables you to carry mm. on doing this kind of work because it really is tremendous what you do. I mean, obviously, you have a very full life. You're, you know, you're a mum, you work, but you do this as well. And it's just giving. Um, and I'd be really interested just to get an insight into how how you do. So the what's so in, interesting about self care is that again it's completely different for everyone. Yeah. So it will mean different things to different people. Yeah. And when I was talking to people for Pathways, the second book, which is all about self care, um, some people felt very strongly that. Um, a diagnosis for a mental health condition was disempowering and somebody else felt very strongly that getting the right diagnosis and therefore the right medication or the right treatment was completely empowering and that was their self-care people feel very strongly about the different things that work for them for some people I had this conversation a lot around self-care is more than just a bubble bath um yeah there is kind of very mainstream view that you can an app and do a mindfulness and yeah. suddenly and then actually when that doesn't work it can be a bit upsetting or annoying and actually for other people who are incredibly busy and might have really um work really long hours for them self-care is as simple as ring fencing an hour to say right this is, this is my time I'm going to go and have a bubble bath and mm. read my book and I'm scheduling that into the calendar because that is my self-care time yeah. So it does mean completely different things for different people. 
And I think one of the things that I always go back to and that I will always talk about a lot in the book is breathing, because breathing is the thing that completely rebalances your system. If you are experiencing physical feelings of distress or emotional feelings of distress in your mind, breathing is the thing that literally brings your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system into balance. And so breathing deeply and well sends a message to your brain that says, actually, I'm not in anxiety mode. It can sort of trick your system into into calming down again by doing breathing. So that's the the one thing that I think is really, really important to realise how how much breathing can help Mm. reduce symptoms of distress in the moment. And the other thing is, is quite a mindful practice of utilising the senses. So if you, you can, and because you can do these things anywhere, um, if you think, what can I see, smell, hear, taste, by concentrating on something in the moment you're bringing yourself back to the present yeah and the present is the only place that you can let go of the fear of the past or the worry of what might happen in the future Mm. continually trying to do things to bring yourself back into the present moment you might think well what can I feel I can feel the ground underneath my feet I can see the steam misting over a cup of tea I can smell freshly cut grass whatever it is you are continually pulling your brain back to being present. And there's loads of different ways that that can be done through yoga, through singing, through mantras. Um, And so it's kind of about working out for yourself what, what works for you to keep yourself in the present moment. Because as soon as you start worrying about, well, I've got this to do and that's on my shopping list and I've got some stress, then you've lost your mindful mindset lost it yeah yeah so however you can focus on the present moment as the sort of your anchor however you do that that's the place that I think for me is really beneficial to get to so helpful really really helpful and in terms of just coming to the end now in terms of helping listeners with just how to be a better listener is there any Mm. could could we maybe give like three steps or three kind of points that people can remember when they're you know they're suddenly they're in a conversation and they're they remember oh I think I need to try and listen a bit more yeah so I've got five and they're called shush tips um and you can find them on the Samaritans website so shush if you think of the s stands for show you care Um, And you can apply this to others or to yourself, but it's about making time to really be in the present moment with either somebody or yourself to show you care that you're giving your time and your full attention. H stands for have patience. So it might not always work. The the first time that you say to somebody, you're right, do you want to talk? Um, You might have to ask again. You might have to work on yourself opening up but it's about having patience and understanding that it's fine if this isn't going to happen right now, it might happen in the future. And when you're listening to somebody, having patience that eventually you will get to the place that you need to. And so will they. And then so S H U is for use open questions. Mm. So ask a question that has a yes, no answer. You're immediately shutting down the conversation. So if you say you're right, actually your, your only response really is to be able to say, yep, or, no which is more unlikely whereas if you say how are you it's an open question how are you feeling people have to think oh actually I'm feeling and then it leads to mm. a full and then a conversation so the using open questions is really important s is say it back um so if someone glosses over something and you've heard a little snippet or something that you would like to pull out of a conversation Um, And again, you can apply it to yourself by thinking, well, what is it that I'm going through? What is it that I'm feeling? Maybe I'll write some notes and then that will lead me to a further understanding of kind of saying something back. Here's you, makes you hear it in a different way so you can process it differently. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is H for have courage. Mm -hmm. 
so again it's just don't be afraid to talk to somebody about their how they're feeling it doesn't mean that you have to fix their problem it doesn't mean that you have to take the weight of their problem on all you need is listen to that person and it's the same for yourself don't repress what you're feeling have courage to be curious and ask yourself how am I feeling as a daily practice so that when the chips are down we are resilient enough to to either you know get back up the mountain or to ask for help if we need it oh wow those are so brilliant and so helpful and I feel like you you're kind of covering all the ground that I wanted to touch on in our last question um, because of all the words that you're using so um, to end the idea behind the tenderness revolution is it's in having this quality of tenderness for ourselves and others and in doing that we use the three c's because they enable us to fully see the truth about the way things are and they are courage curiosity and compassion And just to finish, I wanted to ask if you had to choose one of these qualities that really means the most to you in your life, what would you choose and why? I think courage. Um, Courage is the thing that stands out for me. And I think it goes back to this idea of if not you, then who? If it doesn't start with you in this moment, what can you expect? If you want the world to change and if you want the world to be a better place, then do one small thing that will make it a better place. And that one small thing can then set up its own chain reaction of more positive things. So even if that is smiling at a stranger, you never know how what kind of difference that might make to their day or if it's signing up to volunteer, if it's helping out a neighbour. One small act of kindness, you know, if we all got into the habit of doing one small act of kindness, it could create its own little epidemic of kindness, I think. Well, I so agree with you. And it comes back sort of full circle to to your story at the beginning. And and it's that thing of, of, you know, it only has to, to be something small, but if we all connect to that, part of ourselves that sort of tender part and remember Mm. that we all have that at our core and we can all show each other kindness and compassion even when you know we have all these difficult things happening in our lives it's possible Mm. and I'm sure it in many ways it helps it helps us feel better as well Mm. so yeah more more now than ever it's it's so important Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation and I've learned so much. I've learned so much from you about this really, really, really important skill that we all need to work on listening. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Tenderness Revolution. I hope you come back for more because my aim with this podcast is to help us become more aware of these moments of kindness and compassion and how they shape our lives and enable us to feel more connected to the world around us.